Come on, let's acknowledge that there is nobody like our God. No one can compare. There's no one beside our God. Our God is the greatest. We worship you, great Jehovah. We honor your excellence, your majesty, your glory, your strength, your wisdom, your power. God, you are our everything and there's nobody like you. Hallelujah. Come on, worship the God that is like no other. Come on, we sing. Say, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. Because your name is strength and your name is power. A strong tower and it makes me safe. Say, oh, say, oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name, cause your name, your name is power, oh, a strong town, and it makes me say, come on, let's lift our hands on this part, and we sing, oh,
there's no God like you. For the joy of the Lord. Do you have joy on this morning? Despite of everything that's going on in our world, God wants to give us a joy that is unspeakable. We're just going to open with a uh, word of prayer with a short scripture. We read a scripture earlier from Psalms 13 that says, How long, O Lord? But I'm going to skip to the end of this chapter when it says, uh, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Come on, let's join in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We want to thank you for being the creator of the universe, the Lord of God, the Lord of all. You said those who worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. So God, here we are to worship you in spite of technical difficulties, in spite of things not going always the way we think it should go. We are here, oh God, to give you worship. God is looking for true worshipers. Come on, lift your hands. If you are here to be a true worshiper, it doesn't matter what's going on in your world. It doesn't matter if Facebook or YouTube is acting right. I will bless the Lord at all times. So Lord, we come to give you glory. We come to give you worship, adoration, and praise. Bless our time today. Let it be powerful. Let it be life-changing. Lord, let something be said that will change our hearts and the way we think. We love you. We worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. this moment we want to just say thank you God for this day and this season of gathering and worship and even Lord as we continue to endure Lord all the compounding traumas and pandemics that are happening God we also just want to pause and acknowledge Lord that even in the midst of all these challenges you're working and you're answering our prayers for at least the last couple years we've been praying God for Lord the system to shift as it relates to our children down at the border lord who have been locked in cages god we thank you for the ruling this week that demanded that the children in cages and incarcerated at the border be set free god we thank you that lord even in the midst of this hard time god you answered the prayers of so many that have been praying and so god now we ask for the expediency lord of their release we ask lord god for those who are lord serving and working in these systems lord god to lord follow these directives and let these children lord come lord god to safe places with family members and loved ones and friends god i thank you lord that even in the midst of all of lord the unrest and the 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 righteous protests that are happening lord we're seeing systems we're seeing monuments we're seeing lord god icons fall to the ground all across this country Lord, I thank you, Lord, that even while we were protesting in the streets, Lord, we didn't see, Lord, a spike in the COVID infections, Lord, that are attributed to our protest. I just want to believe, God, that you met us in the streets, Lord, and you kept us and you protected us because we were, Lord God, suffering for righteousness sake. And so, God, I just want to acknowledge and we want to acknowledge, Lord, that you are being faithful to us. Even, Lord, in a time where wickedness seems to be on the loose, Lord, thank you that you're winking at us to let us know that you are at work. And so, God, even today, Lord, we're continuing to hear of, Lord, terrible, terrible incidents of, of violence and death, Lord, at the hands of the systems, whether they're police, whether they're the virus, Lord God, whether it is, Lord, the wicked and competent leadership of our national political systems lord i pray for the family of elijah mcclain lord god in in colorado lord i pray lord for the continued loss of life lord in so many hospitals and and clinics lord god because of the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus i pray lord god 
for those, Lord God, countries across the world, Lord God, who are continuing to experience, Lord God, the, the, the forces of, of repression and imperialism. I pray, Lord, that even those who are incarcerated here in our own country, Lord God, in our state prisons, in our local jails, Lord, I pray, God, that you will set captives free, Lord. I pray for those that are coming home from jail. I pray, God, that they would, Lord, have, Lord, the capability and the resources, Lord, to be in safe spaces. I pray for our unhoused loved ones. I pray for those caught in cycles of trafficking, Lord God, and, and violence. Lord, we still lift up, as we always do, all of these issues to you because we know that you are able to do anything but fail. And on this day, God, where we acknowledge, Lord, the, the, the very powerful and, and important contributions, Lord, of our trans and, and queer community, Lord, I pray that you will on this, this day, Lord, uh, give them special affirmation and blessings. I pray that they will know and be seen, Lord, even by those around them, but more than anything, God, they will know that you love and you are their God and they are your people. And Lord, I pray that on this, this day and even through this month, Lord, they will continue to find peace and safety in a very violent world. And so God, right now, we just want to say we exalt you. We exalt you above all of our problems, above all of our circumstances, above all of our situations. Have your way today and we'll give you glory and praise in Jesus name we pray. Let the people of the way just thank God right now. Let's exalt the Lord. Let's give God some praise because he's worthy of it. He's worthy to be glorified. He's worthy to be magnified. One more time, just lift your voice and tell the Lord that we exalt thee above all of our problems. We exalt thee, say, we exalt. We're so blessed, so glad to have you hanging back out with us, and thank you for your patience this morning. Amen. The, the devil got in the machine, and, and uh, we just uh, had to work on through it, but thank God for Minister Mike and the whole team uh, that helped us uh, get this thing moving and cooking, and uh, we want to really uh, make this day a day where uh, we have great worship and prayer and fellowship one with another, so let folks know we're back online. Let folks know that we're back in fellowship. Share the YouTube link. Share the Facebook stream. Do a watch party. Say hello to your friends and comrades and members in the, in the chat room. And let's just bless the Lord. Let's just bless the Lord. Let's just bless the Lord. You know, it's so important for us to uh, be reminded of all the things that are happening here at The Way. So turn your attention to some announcements that are coming right up. And then I'm excited to bring back uh, afterwards uh, our panel uh, for our LGBTQ Awareness Month uh, as we stand in solidarity uh, of our Pride Month. So let's see what's happening at The Way this week. And following that, you're going to get a great conversation between myself and one of our superstar members, Alasia Clarendon. Welcome to The Way. We want to help you connect, grow, and serve. July marks our 15th year anniversary. Now let the praise begin. This year we will have guest speakers and worshipers and a whole lot more. Look for the advertisements that will be posted on our Facebook page and our website. That's www.thewayberkeley.com. Every Tuesday night from 6 to 7, join us online for a time of prayer. This weekly gathering helps to strengthen our spiritual discipline of prayer in an inviting and communal way. Don't miss this point of connection on Tuesday nights. To register for the Zoom link, go to the Church Center app or click Events under the Connect tab on our website. Join us during the month of July on Wednesdays for our noonday devotionals. The pastoral staff and I remain committed to praying for you and supporting you with a weekly word of inspiration. That's every Wednesday at noon on our Facebook page. Also, this Wednesday, July 1st, join us for a time of fellowship online for some good times, smiling faces, 
and conversation with Pastor Mike. To register, go to the Church Center app and click on Wednesday Church Huddle. After following the prompts, then you will receive an email confirmation with all of the registration details attached. So join us on Wednesday at 7 p.m. on our church huddle. The Justice and Mercy Ministry will be meeting today at noon for a monthly check-in by Zoom. You should have received an email registration. For more information about the Justice and Mercy Ministry, visit www.thewayberkeley.com. Please give attention to our website and weekly emails for any changes or updates to our weekly events. Thank you for worshiping here at The Way. Hey everyone, God bless. This is Pastor Mike and uh, I'm so excited to be joining all of us on this Sunday morning. Um, as all of us are aware, this whole month is a month uh, that is uh, set aside to celebrate, remember, and educate ourselves about the contributions and the journey of our LGBTQIAA loved ones. Um, and uh, it is called Pride Month. And we here at The Way uh, for at least the last couple of years have been really attempting to make sure that all of our queer loved ones here in this congregation are not uh, sitting at the margins, but they are uh, very much included and put at the center of our congregation and affirmed and loved and appreciated. And so uh, we wanted to spend this particular uh, uh, emphasis Sunday focusing on Black trans women and the particular ways in which Black trans women are most vulnerable in this uh, society. And I'm so excited and blessed uh, to be able to have uh, one of our own members, the great Lasia Clarendon, who uh, is hanging out with us on this morning. Lasia's been a member of The Way for, whew, has it been a decade yet? Late nine? Yes, 2009, yeah, 2009, 10, yeah. Woo. So, so La Lasia has uh, been here with us when we were in the earliest years of our journey and uh, has hung with us. Hopefully we haven't traumatized you too bad, Lasia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here, so. <laughs> here, still here. Well, um, I want to just appreciate you for uh, helping us to, on this Sunday of Emphasis, um, just open up the conversation a little bit. And so um, you have uh, had your own journey of faith and your journey of um, uh, sexual identity and formation. And uh, maybe folks may not know you besides uh, the fact that you are a WNBA all-star basketball player, world class, you know, even right now you are, I think, in consideration to go to the Olympics. So you, you, you're not a scrub. Somebody say amen, right? And uh, <laughs> you, you help, you help lead the, uh, the Cal women's basketball team to the final four, along with Talia, another one of our members. Hey, Talia, how you doing? And so you are a, a super, super vibrant member of our congregation, but it, it wasn't always an easy journey for you. So maybe just share a little bit of your journey um, coming up and, 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 and some of the real uh, critical moments that have made you more comfortable, not just in your skin, but also in this thing that we call uh, following the ways of Jesus? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, not to go back too far, but, you know, we all start in our childhood. I um, didn't really go to church a ton growing up black mom Pentecostal church. So we went every once in a while, that whole story of like, why is it so long? Why do I have to wear a dress? Yeah. Why is Auntie Dorothy running up and down the aisles, swinging from the chandeliers? Just a lot of, um, you know, a lot of I didn't understand about church or religion or God growing up. Our family wasn't super into it, but kind of that, like, you got to go every once in a while. So um, for me, growing up, there was always this kind of separation or idea that like I wasn't really taught about God or understanding, you know, God's love and, and that kind of message. Um, my older sister is gay, had come out. So everything I'd heard about religion and God was negative growing up that like, you know, you go to hell if you're gay. Um, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, like all of those just dangerous, really hurtful uh, messages. Um, even though my family wasn't super religious, that kind of pervasiveness that religious can carry religion can carry. Um, so fast forward, went to Cal, which I now know God had a lot to do with because it just felt right, right? You like, you had God's hand moving over your life before you even realized it. Um, so Cal just felt right. I came up here and then Talia, as you spoke of, was like, hey, I heard about this dope church called the Way Christian Center. You want to go with me? 
And God knows why I even said yes, knowing what I knew about my sexuality at the time and knowing what I knew that people said about God and said about religion. Uh, but I was just open, like I always had an open heart. Um, and I'm really thankful for that because I was never really callous or like, I just, something was, there was a curiosity about me. And so I went to the way and I was just like, that's the rest is history. But I, I walked in the doors um, and just felt- I, such I remember, I remember um, in worship, I remember, the Sunday where you and Ty, a number of you all were together. And it was one of the moments where I really felt like, man, God is doing something special, not just with you, but in our congregation, because you were in the back and your eyes were closed and you just had your hands up. And it just, I just felt like I saw the Holy Spirit, like just descend on you. I mean, you were <laughs> just, you were just in like a totally transcendent place. And, um, and and it was a very it was special to watch it even though I didn't know you very well I was like man God is really doing something with that sister who was that sister I didn't know yeah. people. I didn't know who you was from Adam and so so it was it was just great to see um, the way you were open and and you came and and uh, and and yeah the rest is history but but your journey was one that you know required a lot of conversation both with us and Pastor Don I remember sitting on on our couch in the office and just talking about what does the scripture say about this and and you know, mm -hmm. you know what does it mean for me to you know want to follow Jesus but be gay and on and on and on and and um you know even though in some of those moments uh my theological or our theological kind of uh formation wasn't uh as say open or affirming as it may be at this moment um, I think there was still this kind of baseline of like love and 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 um embrace and not trying to problematize you. I, yeah. I don't know if we're overstating that, but just, just talk a little bit about what that journey was like, because I am trying to help us as a congregation as we talk about Black trans women and mm -hmm. their unique vulnerability in this season to appreciate that our, our, our minimal response has to be radical compassion and empathy and embrace. It can't be um, the transphobia stuff that too often makes people feel like they're not human and they're out here dealing with this on their own. So yeah. let's hear a little bit about, about some of that journey and what you learned, what we did wrong and how we can be better. Yeah. I think there is what was so fascinating about trying to come to terms with my sexuality and now my gender as a non-binary person, as a gender queer person was that although the way was accepting and like you said, I could, I walked in the doors and it wasn't like, why is she holding her hand? There was none of that. There was no like excommunication, but that's how pervasive religion is in society and how pervasive these teachings can be. Um, that how much like, you know, I struggled with it. It was like this. And I, I can't believe I struggled with it that much. Of course, my parents had taught, had been saying those things, but it was like, I had struggled with what I had heard, but I was sitting here in a church that was accepting me, but there's still that disconnect. And so that I think is the work we have to do as a church, as religious leaders, as people is kind of like, we almost have to come out as accepting and not transphobic. The same way white people have to come out as not racist, not like, we don't know where white people stand until they let us know. They're like, oh, actually I'm for Black Lives Matter. I'm for, you know, equality for Black people. And that same way, I think a lot of you know, straight church members, even gay members need to come out and make sure that they're openly supporting the trans community, openly supporting people who are different than them, because historically there is a lot of, a lot of disconnect, even within our own communities. Mm. Um, so for me, it was having those conversations with you where like really early on, I remember it was my partner at the time and we just talked to you and you didn't have all the answers, but you weren't condemning, right? And it was like, you could tell like it was challenging for you to be like, Dang, I, you know, I don't have all the answers. I'm not, I'm just, I'm just a human, but. I remember, remember we were at Cancun's and the first time you came in and you cut all your hair off. Cause you know, Lasia used to have like, you know. Locks, yeah. Locks hair. And I remember the first time she cut her, I was like, oh my God, what happened to your hair? And you just were kind of like, oh, I know. You said, I think it'll grow back whenever I want it to. And I just kind of feel like a moron, like, oh, McBride. But yeah, I, I was, you know, not fully, you know, I was running into my own kind of like barriers trying to figure it out. And, and, and I was, and we are, and I continue to be on, on a journey of learning. But I do think to your point, it's really important for us to be curious and to not claim like we have it all figured out. But, um, but you were so patient with us and loving and you kept coming back and, 
and and uh and that was a big part of our journey as well yeah yeah there's this there is a um there is just a palpable love at the way that is that is transcendent like that is it is bigger than any one person there because i've never been in such a like spirit field place that that is god like it, i believe god is much bigger than gender much bigger than pastor mike than myself than any of these you know constraints these um ideas or systems we could have created and when you walk in the way I really credit that to like your leadership and the people who make it up because it is just, it's bigger than ourselves. But of course, then we have to be the human people who have to like walk the walk and talk and talk and like actually <laughs> deal with our own stuff when we're getting bumped and like, oh, that, like that made me feel uncomfortable, right? Like that same work that we're asking people to do for us that we have to be willing um, to do when we run into those uncomfortable moments. Um, and it's something you just see in every, I mean, we still deal with it in sports as liberal as the WNBA is. We still have those people who are like, what? I don't want everyone to see him gay or I don't want this, or I'm not going to support the trans person. You're like, you're the gay black woman, but you won't support the trans woman. Like, so that's, yeah. a, that's, that's within the gay community. Like, yeah, we don't get a lot of support. Like even in our own communities, we have to be cognizant of that, that we're doing the same work that we're asking other people to do of us. Like we're asking them to humanize us, to stop murdering us, to stop perpetuating violence against us. And meanwhile, we have like the most vulnerable marginalized group of society right now and especially of our lgbt community is black trans women who are just being you know murdered and violently brutally like dismembered and just it's just like where we're finally hearing the cry for them for so long we just ignored it we didn't hear their names we didn't know who they were and so we're finally finally like having marches for them and finally standing up for them but we have such a long way to go and that just my heart just breaks because that's these are our people these are like just the the miseducation and misinformation and and visceral violence that this community faces that like they're just like we're just it's just inhumane and i think there's just such a long way to go about like you're saying the baseline has to be as followers of jesus like a compassion no one's asking you have to have every answer or understand everybody's identity to show up with compassion right yeah like people don't always understand everything about our culture or about black people or how we do things, but we're asking them to have, like humanize us. And so that is the same thing I expect from, you know, everybody within our own community. Yeah. I, 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 um, I really felt compelled to, to make this conversation focused around black trans after um, I saw the, the killing of Dominique Fells in Philadelphia and they found her body um, face down on the banks of the river, her legs were severed, her um, parts of her, her, her appendages were, um, were, were badly, you know, mutilated, her face was mutilated. And I just, I just really felt God speak to me like, you know, how is it that whatever um, comfort or discomfort anyone has with this, you know, person that they can be so brutally harmed and folks are afraid or unwilling or hesitant to just say publicly that should not happen you know and yeah. i know as a as a black male who you know we've all been trying to figure out how do we talk about healthy masculinity get rid of toxic masculinity deal with patriarchy and all these different things i know it can feel like a lot like you're just trying to process a lot but our inability to speak out actually makes people's bodies and lives so vulnerable where people feel like they can do this and no one will care. And that's why I really wanted to focus on this. And so as someone who does not fit these categories, but find yourself uh, still very much embracing the life and teachings of Jesus as a follower in the public square, can, what, what would you say to our, our congregation about how we can be more faithful to um, to our queer loved ones, particularly black trans women, what are just some concrete things we can do? Are there some books we can read? Are there some conversations we need to have? Just, you know, not asking you to solve it for us. Cause of course, you know, just like we tell other people like Google, like go, you know, yeah. but, but yeah. just speak to us just as a, as a fellow member of our community and a follower of Jesus. Yeah. I think one, what you spoke to is, is the speaking out is a, is a big one. I think, the hard look in the mirror of you're asking someone right now to say black lives matter, but you're not willing to say black trans lives matter. Mm -hmm. I think is that same level of, you know, hypocrisy and that same level of like, you got to look in the mirror like that. Your silence is the same 
silence that's perpetuating violence. And so um, that would be one of like that level of speaking out because like you said, people's lives are like, and no matter how uncomfortable you are, is not worth someone being, you know, treated and brutalized the way they are. Um, I would say it's changing your proximity too. I love like, there's some good books of like stories that aren't always, you know, we want to read the like gender history and queer things. Like we want to read the Michelle Alexander, like, books that are really dense and good and educate us but the other thing we don't look at enough are just like getting closer to the stories of these people so those are books like janet mock's redefining realness is a good book that i read a few years ago and i was like mind blown of just her story like so many things i just didn't know um about black trans women that i learned by reading her story with the way has always talked about people telling their stories and reading their stories so the books you read don't always have to be these like dense heavy the history of trans people and queer pronouns, it could be something as simple as, you know, searching more books that are trans inclusive or queer inclusive stories, or I haven't watched it yet, but I heard Disclosure was a really good show that's really inclusive for the trans community. So, you know, looking that up on Netflix, um, I could try and give you another list too, I think at the top of my head of actual books, but in that way, you just start to humanize people too. And it's like an issue is like the books I've tried to read around like immigration and different people like, dang, now when I, that issue pops up, I think about that story I read of that person and like that brother or sister I know at the church who's Latinx. Mm -hmm. And so our proximity has to start to get changed to these people. And obviously, you know, some queer people in our, in our, um, you know, congregation that are being affected by this when, you know, like Pulse nightclub happened, like mm -hmm. you could look and be like, dang, that could have been Lasia in that nightclub that night, like a member of our, of our church. So I would really encourage people to change um, your proximity and start to learn some more of these stories. And of course, you always got Google. So language is a big thing. It's something you can do, um, you know, as simple as asking someone their pronouns or being more inclusive in your leadership spaces is just not to assume that people like just because, you know, Pastor Mike looks like a cis man that he wants pronouns that go by he like asking people invites them and gives them the space to just show up right that's what we want is just offer more space for people so you know if we were at church and i was on the panel or something or i was in a bible study group and the first one of the first things we did was say like oh let's go around say your name say your pronouns how you identify that alone would give someone the space to say like oh oh like okay they're thinking about this stuff now i don't have to be in the circle thinking like oh god are they transphobic are they gonna misgender me in that are they not gonna offer space so that's just some some really simple simple things that go a, a long way for people all right people of the way we done heard it straight from Lasia clarendon you know she's uh she's one of the best the way has produced and we're so <laughs> blessed by her um she is uh, a, a great gift to us and to so many and so thank you for giving us an opportunity to um, learn through your eyes and for you to help articulate um, an experience that even as we stand in solidarity, compassion, and friendship, partnership, and love with our queer uh, family members, um, hopefully we can continue to expand that. And uh, as the profits rise, our voices can also rise um, and make room for um, the voices that keep reminding us that the image of God is present in all of us. And uh, if Jesus loves us all, then we got to love one another. So uh, thank you. Love you so much. Give my best to Jess. And uh, can't wait to meet the new baby that's on the way. I know. Uh, December. 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 Cool. All right. Well, God bless everybody. Uh, we'll uh, get back to the rest of our service. Uh, this is Pastor Mike and the great Lasia Clarendon signing out. Yes, yes. The great Lasia Clarendon. Uh, God bless you so much. We love you. We love you. We love you. Um, and thank you for uh, giving us a, a, a peek into your experience as a black trans woman, um, a gender non-conforming woman. Um, it's, it's just, again, worth saying that um, even this whole uh, month of pride actually was kicked off. Uh, I think in 1979, I believe, um, uh, as a result of some uh, what was called the Stonewall Riots. And it was black trans women and gender nonconforming loved ones who were responding to police brutality. So even um, this kind of movement for um, the protection of their bodies and their, their, their uh, existence was grounded out of a uh, response to police violence um, and Marsha Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, a number of other folks, 
uh, really led that effort. And so I think it's, it's worthy of, of our uh, focus and our emphasis to just affirm and uh, declare our love, support, and solidarity uh, with black trans women. Um, I just hope and pray that all of you that are members of the way, um, that you take some time to Google and learn and read and listen a little bit more deeply. Uh, I do believe that some of our silence is grounded in um, our discomfort or lack of uh, resonance with uh, black trans women uh, existence. But I want you to know that the Bible says God has no pleasure in the death of anyone. And so our, our hope and our prayer is that we can begin to lean in and be much more compassionate and in solidarity and grow to affirm and appreciate the imago dei, the, the dignity and the worth and the value of all of the people that God have created and certainly uh, our LGBTQ loved ones are a part of it. So all of you that are members of our church that are part of this community. Uh, just know that your pastor loves you. Um, our church is, uh, as a community, really wants to do right by you and, and make sure that you are always um, being seen and heard. And uh, actually, our, our pastor of our Los Angeles campus, uh, Pastor Jocelyn Harris, is is a wonderful black queer woman who is leading and doing some amazing things down there. And and uh, so we, 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 we all the way in. We in like Flynn, even if we still stumbling our way through it. Um, it is our heart and it is our intention uh, to be good followers of Jesus in this kind of way. It's time to receive the gifts of the people of the way before we get a chance to hear the amazing word of God being preached to this, us this morning. And so we're going to invite you, please keep uh, giving and supporting um, as we endeavor to keep the ministry afloat. It is likely that we're going to continue to be virtual church in all through the summer. Um, I don't see us uh, meeting in, in, in person to worship on Sundays here at this building and facility, uh, mostly because uh, we are still experiencing a spike uh, in infections and in deaths. And just because it's kind of gone out of the news, I want you to know that we are still very much in a, a pandemic, a global pandemic, and the United States is uh, hitting um, some of the highest infection rates because of the just uh, inadequacy of our response as a government and even uh, as uh, citizens, people are still not wearing masks. It's just so very troubling uh, to move around and see people not wearing masks. And so please, child of God, wear a mask. Don't be one of these people who uh, is irresponsible in your stewardship of uh, creation and of one another, wear a mask. Uh, but all of these factors are gonna keep us having virtual church for at least the next 90 days. And so I just need us to all continue to be as faithful as you possibly can. You that are members of the church that need support, uh, you're still finding some financial difficulties and hardships, uh, let us know so we can be a blessing to you. We are indeed uh, going to be pulling together uh, more Love Your Neighbor uh, opportunities, uh, gift cards and grocery drops offs and things of that nature. And so just let us know where you are and what you need, and we'll certainly be a blessing to you in the name of the Lord. Now, I'm excited because we get an opportunity to hear uh, from uh, Pastor Erna uh, she was supposed to have preached her last message here with us as a staff person uh, of our pastoral team um, on the last Sunday of June um, uh, or May. Was it May? May? Last Sunday of May. And of course, uh, George Floyd's death and, and just all of the, the, the deep uh, trauma and response that was happening within uh, not just our community, but all across the country. Uh, you know, she was gracious enough to step aside and let us really turn that service into a service of healing and lament. Um, and so we, we're so glad to have her uh, be able to come and just preach to us the word of God on uh, this Sunday. Uh, Pastor Erna and uh, Cam are wonderful, wonderful uh, loved ones, extended members of our church, and uh, I still see them uh, plugging in and connecting in with folks uh, all the time, and so it's great to be able to have them still in such close proximity to us. So let's get ready to be blessed this morning and hear uh, the great preaching and teaching and ministry of uh, Pastor Erna Hackett as she comes and boldly proclaims to us the word of the Lord. Uh, let's receive her and enjoy the word of God today. Hello, The Way family. I miss you guys so much. I'm so glad to be with you today. And uh, 
even if it's digitally. I realized for me what was on my heart wasn't necessarily sharing something new, but I guess sort of a summary paragraph. I felt really led to actually go back to the scripture that is the first one I preached when I came to the way out, out of uh, Luke 1. And I know over the course of the last couple of years, I've talked about Mary and Zechariah and Mary and Elizabeth because they've really become my life scripture. And I just wanted to now take what I realize now is a kind of a complete thought of the last two years. So I came in holding this scripture and how as I'm leaving, I'm you have changed me and taught me new ways to think about it. So, uh, some of the stuff I'm talking about in the scriptures I'm referencing will feel familiar. And I hope that uh, you'll um, give me that grace of being a little bit repetitive. I'm sort of been reflecting on this as a summary paragraph of some of my theological formation of my time at The Way. And so that's the journey I wanted to take with you today. Luke opens with this elderly couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who have been wanting a child for a long time. And for uh, the Jewish people, this would uh, stir a lot of memories because couples that are longing to have children is a really big part of their history and story. And so they'd be like, yes, this is us. We're a country that's waiting for a Messiah. This is a couple that's waiting for a child. Like this makes sense that this is how Luke is starting. And then we go, you know, we're in Jerusalem and we're in the temple. We're with Zechariah as he's serving as a priest. So this would make a lot of sense to the Jewish people. Like, yes, God's going to do something new and this is where it's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, I like to picture it like a movie, right? Like visualize it. So um, Zechariah is this older man. And it's helpful to know that this would have been a really significant day for Zechariah. You don't go in deeper into the temple every day to light the incense. There were 8,000 priests serving in Israel at that time. And they were divided into 24 different divisions. And they each had, each division had 300 priests. And the Abijah division that Zechariah was in would serve for two weeks out of the year. Every day. Day, 56 priests would serve at the temple and those 56 priests during the two services would draw lots and if you drew you know the lot you got to go deeper into the temple and uh, light incense and the incense the smoke would go up and, and the people of Israel would stand outside and they would pray and the incense was a symbol of their prayers rising up to God and when you drew the lot after that you uh, did not get to do it again so when Zechariah goes in to light the incense, it's like the pinnacle of his career. So you can feel like the music is keying up, like the intensity in the movie, like something's about to happen. And right then as he's lighting the incense, an angel appears and you can feel like if this is the movie, you're like, yes, this is what we've been waiting for. It's about to be on. And this angel says to Zechariah, this prayer, this longing of your heart, it's been heard by God and... Your prayer is going to be answered. You're going to have a child. And Zechariah is like, oh, no, actually, I don't think so. You probably don't realize that me and my wife are really old. And that's like what kind of passed that time of our lives. And what I love about this section is that this angel starts to trash talk uh, uh, Zechariah about who he is. He goes, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You must not know who I am. My name is Gabriel. Oh, you must not know where I came from. I recently came from the presence of the Lord. And you are going to have a child. But because you're talking nonsense, your mouth will stop talking. And no more words are going to come out of your mouth until this child is born. And that's where you can feel like all the music stops. And the needle goes off the record. And you just feel like, oh, I'm sorry. Is this what we were waiting for? Is this what we've been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for an angel to show up and tell Zechariah it's on and Zechariah to get it wrong? <laughs> and then you have to picture the camera panning back. You have to picture the camera panning back from the temple and then panning back from Jerusalem and then panning back to that first city outside of Jerusalem and then to that next tinier suburb outside of Jerusalem that nobody knows. Of. And then like that tiny little town where like you get a burger before you really hit the five for the long road trip down to L.A. And then that town that you're like, does anybody live there? And that's Nazareth. So then we come up 
on Mary. And Mary, in contrast to the temple and in contrast to a priest at the pinnacle of his priestly career and in contrast to many Israelites praying and in contrast to being in Jerusalem, in contrast to being in the center of religious life, we are somewhere obscure, this tiny pit stop, and we have this no-name peasant girl, most likely illiterate, destined to be married, have many children, maybe lose some of them in childbirth or uh, lose them young, live and die anonymously. And that's Mary's destiny, just like basically every other young girl at that time. And the angel appears to her and says, you have been chosen to partner with the living God in one of the most intimate ways that you can. And she has questions too about how that will happen, but her questions don't upset Gabriel in the same way that Zechariah's questions did. And so uh, the angel explains um, that she'll be able to have a child even though she's a virgin because the Holy Spirit will hover over her. And she says, okay, let it be to me according to your word. And the other thing that is given to her is the gift of community. Because then Gabriel says, your cousin is also having a kind of weird pregnancy experience. And Mary knows right away that's who she needs to go to and be with. Luke opening in this way, this framework of the people that you think are going to lead the way, the people with education, the people with position, um, is where I came in. It's part of what I left my former role, I left being in white evangelical spaces because I knew I needed to have a Zechariah season, a silencing of the voice that I had heard from a lot. Um, I was in a deconstructing phase. I was thinking about, um, instead of being formed by white, straight men, my theological formation and my spiritual formation, I needed to listen to the Marys of the world. And so I didn't wanna just uh, focus on what I wasn't going to listen to, which is the Zechariah season. And I think we all need to lean into that though. Like who are the voices that have toxically shaped you, even if they had good intention, but they're no longer the voices that you listen to so that this new thing that God is happening can be birthed. Is it these patriarchal voices? Is it this male centered leadership? Is it this heteronormative uh, leadership that says, um, yeah, you can be queer, but could you like dial down the queerness? Um, don't make anybody uncomfortable with your queerness. It's, are those the voices that we need to stop listening to? To women who we're still waiting sometimes for permission to fully be ourselves and fully lead. Um, to those who don't have like a formal degree and feel like uh, you're not legitimate without that, but you know the Holy Spirit has given you something that you're supposed to steward. What are the traditional voices that we need to stop listening to? That's really was how I came into the way. And what I'm so grateful for was I got to learn so much about a tradition utterly unconnected to the one that had been so painful for me. And so coming in here and as Pastor Mike says, uh, learning from the Black Holiness Pentecostal tradition, learning about loving and engaging with social justice um, from a Black liberation perspective has been um a season of Mary for me, a season of listening to a new voice and centering a new voice. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. So after the angel leaves Mary, Mary rushes off to see her cousin. And what I would say is, as I stayed at the way, my focus shifted from deconstructing, uh, like who do I need to stop listening to and being formed? Uh, and it shifted to this radical community that is being shaped by Elizabeth and Mary. I just love this. It says in Luke 139, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. 
but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the sound of the greeting of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. I love this picture so, so, so much. I love this picture because if you think about it, when we met Elizabeth at the beginning of Luke, she's just like an elderly woman who wanted a child but didn't have it. Now we have this older pregnant woman who's in this house that's very quiet because her husband has been silenced and just loudly yelling what she sees the Holy Spirit doing in Mary. And I just love this because one, I think still to this day, women, women of color, black women are told to tamp down, to be quiet. That if these people, you know, like, oh, you know, uh, like Elizabeth, maybe like your ministry should be on hold because like your husband's ministry is struggling. And there's just none of that. She is loud, declarative, and the work of the Holy Spirit in her lets her see what the Holy Spirit is doing in this other young woman and it is radical and revolutionary and filled with love and affirmation and she is theologizing she's interpreting what she's seeing happening around her not in the temple not in Jerusalem but in a house in a space that is usually dismissed and relegated to where women stay to do their woman stuff and God has said this is where radical community will happen this is where theologizing will happen this is where the new Thing happens. And it's not anymore just about the voice that you're not going to listen to. It's about these new voices that are creating this new and radical community. It's why I'm so delighted that um, there's been this panel today of brothers and sisters, uh, our queer family sharing, because that is a voice that we need to be listening to, amplifying, following their leadership. It is some of the new radical community um, that we as followers of, as, of Jesus are imagining in to. And so um, Elizabeth greets Mary. And what I love about this is when Mary has this experience of being seen by Elizabeth, it, it's after that that she's able to interpret what she does interpret what she has experienced, interpret what's happening in her body and give us the Magnificat, which is this amazing, radical piece of theology. So I didn't know this about the Magnificat, right? But this is this amazing theological reflection that Jesus goes on to reference both in Luke 4 and in his inaugural address and later in the Sermon on the Plain. But when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, uh, he has brought down the powerful, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. People try to just diminish what she's doing as if it's not theological work. But when the British uh, were ruling India, did you know that her words were prohibited from being sung in church? They were not allowed because people because the colonizing power understood how radical it was they understood that it was political they understood that it was about justice and liberation and so even though people have tried to like be like well oh, that's just neat pregnant lady journal poetry people in power know it for exactly what it is in the 80s in guatemala uh you know, there was an a group of incredibly impoverished folks who were coming together for revolution and they discovered Mary's words and it was empowering them and mobilizing them. And because of that, the Guatemalan government actually banned any public recitation of Mary's words. Similarly, uh, in Argentina during the Dirty War, um, people were printing pictures of Mary's radical liberative theology on posters all over the capital. And they, um, the military junta of Argentina, they outlawed any displays of it. So what I see happening here is in the 
uh, arc for me in my journey with you all at the way was I came in and I was like, I got to silence some voices and stop listening to them. And I, I need to move into uh, listening to Mary. But as I've stayed, it's become less about the voices I'm not listening to and then seeing what is the radical community that we should be leaning into and creating. And so now on the tail end of my time at The Way, I began not just to see, be blessed by the radical community that is The Way, but continue now to imagine even uh, deeper, wider, expansive, liberative dreams. Where I, What I'm thinking about and what I just can't get over is this idea of the place of our imaginations in social justice and this idea that all social justice is science fiction. Um, you know, this comes from, you know, Octavia Butler comes from uh, Afrofuturism, comes from um, uh, folks like Octavia's Broods. I really want to credit Black women thinkers who have exposed me to this. Um, but the idea that social justice isn't reaching back for anything, but it's imagining a world that we've never seen. And so, just like Mary and Elizabeth are creating a new kind of community and a new theologizing community that we've never seen, that they, we have never seen before. I think as we are in this season of uprising and disruption, it is about, um, what is energizing me is, uh, what is the, the big dream? So Octavia's Brood, on their website, they have this thing that says, the idea of visionary fiction allows us to move from asking the question, what is a realistic win, which is one that organizers ask, to what is the world we want to live in? And I just have been thinking about that because I don't just dream of justice for Ahmaud Arbery, though I do. And I don't just dream of justice for George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Rhea Milton or Dominique Feltz. Dominique Fells, it's not enough that the police officers are arrested or that they go to trial or that they are found guilty. Yes, I want that to happen, but I have dreams, dreams of a world where the end of anti-Black violence, that where there's generations of people who don't even know what white supremacy is, what anti-Blackness is. I have spent more time recently just letting my imagination energize me because it is grueling and there is a lot that is so discouraging and traumatizing. But I do spend time thinking about what is a world like what would a world without prisons be? Like I know I'm following the leadership, obviously, of those who have been dreaming these dreams for a long time. What would a world without guns be like? Not just a world with fewer guns, not just like n guns that shoot less than a hundred bullets a second, but just a world where there are no mini murder machines. Like, let's just imagine it. I imagine a world, I, when I talk about women or women identifying folks, can you imagine a world where you put on whatever you want to wear? and you walk out of your house at whatever time of day you want to walk out. You can go wherever you want without being hyper-conscious of your context or fearing for your safety. Everyone I know says she can't imagine that world, but let's imagine it for a moment. Because what we want to build, this radical community, requires an imagination that is deep and wide and broad so that when we're laboring away in the everyday practicals, we have that to hold on to, that we together collectively have a liberative dream and imagination. And one of the things I've been thinking about uh, is that the dreams we follow, it's not just individual dreams, right? Because we live in an individualistic culture. So it can be easy sometimes to be like, oh yeah, what's my dream? What's the dream I'm going to do? Liberation doesn't come through just individualistic effort, right? We may have our individual place in that, but it is a collective dream that has to be labored for collectively. And the dreams we have to have are the dreams of those most on the margins, right? So when I'm talking to white folks, I'm like, well, we're not going to follow the dreams of white men because even when white men dream about the future, they're still in charge and the people of color are like decorative if 
if we're even there and women are still just like emotional side pieces um, that motivate their great epic journey. We, it's not about the dreams of those in power and it's not even just about our individualistic dreams, but it is the collective dream following the lead of those most impacted by unjust systems. So I love that right now there is the, you know, black folks most impacted by uh, police violence and uh, mass incarceration, the dream of uh, police abolishing the police and uh, prison abolition is getting to be heard. I want to listen to the dreams of indigenous disability justice advocates, because even when I dream dreams, I dream able-bodied dreams. When I, I want to dream dreams that are led to, uh, given to us by our, uh, trans black women because when i dream dreams i still dream cis hetero dreams and so i want us to collectively listen to the dreams of liberation and justice that come from the most marginalized so afrofuturism uh, has been helping me do that and also uh, indigenous futurism and so there's this beautiful quote that I wanted to share with you. It says, indigenous futurism allows for everyday indigenous peoples to restore their beings, bodies, genders, sexualities, and reproductive lives from colonial institutions, projecting decolonial love and kinship into the cosmos. I am obsessed with this quote. Let me just, indigenous futurism allows for everyday indigenous peoples to restore their beings, bodies, genders, sexualities, and reproductive lives from colonial institutions, projecting decolonial love and kinship into the cosmos. As I imagine a liberated future, I follow this idea of projecting, spreading, sharing, decolonial love and kinship. To me, that is another way of talking about the Holy Spirit, just which is just and liberative and isn't colonial, but is this, I think the Holy Spirit is so much connected to our imaginations. And I know that you've been in this season of little fires everywhere and that this idea of uh, expansive decolonial love, I just love it. And it's a part of my dream of the radical community that we're leaning into and living into. So, as I'm, as I have been closing my time at the way I have been leaning deeply into imagination, into creating these radical communities, into listening to the dreams of those most on the margins. And I think I have been deeply sitting with how can we, even in our social justice practice, continue to uh, make sure that we have liberated, decolonized, um, Practi uh, methods of leaning into social justice that aren't beholden to patriarchy, that aren't beholden to heteronormativity, that aren't beholden to these patterns, um, I think, of workaholism, of martyring ourselves on, for the sake of the cause, um, that we have to pursue justice now in ways that embody the values of the community we want to see come into existence. That it can't be something that we will manifest later if we're not living into it now, particularly for women of color. And I've said this many times and I feel like I just have to say, it's what I want to close with is for women and particularly the amazing, amazing black women who have welcomed me into their lives and stories at the way. I never question if you will show up with all your hearts to do the heavy lifting. You always do. But I really imagine a space where right now is a time to live into your mental health, your emotional well being, your physical well being, where you don't have to expend yourself to a level that is exhausting and beyond your healthy limits because you've been told you have to, your joy and your wholeness and your wellness is for later and you have to martyr yourself for the cause. What I wanna say is the liberative dream that I am carrying with me is that we can pursue those beautiful practices now. How Mary and Elizabeth create beautiful, healthy, loving, affirming community with and for each other. 
And so I hope, beautiful family of the way, that as we continue to work together for our shared liberation, that will be done in a way that holds so much room for joy and pleasure, community and affirmation, healthiness right now. I love you. I am so deeply honored to have journeyed with you these last couple of years. So deeply grateful for all the ways you invited me into your lives and your stories. And I wanted to end. I know many of the things I talked about today, you've heard me talk about before, but this is my journey in a complete thought. So thank you. I love you guys. What a powerful word. What a powerful word by our own Pastor Erna. Pastor Erna, we love you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your heart. Before you rush off to do anything else today, I know we're a little later on the schedule on your Sunday plans, but can you just take a moment just to sit in this incredible word that was shared with us? Can you just take a moment and take a few deep breaths? Before you rush off to, to brunch or go off to start cooking or, you know, going out to take a walk. Can you just sit in this word for just a minute? These were amazing words. Just things like expansive decolonial love, what that would look like. Come on, just take a moment just to close your eyes and invite the Holy Spirit to give you a new imagination a new imagination of what it would really look like to live in his, king, in his kingdom where we are all one, where all these ideologies and all the things that have um, suppressed us and colonized us and all these things that it just melts away in the presence of God. Come on, take a moment and ask God. I love... Um, when Pastor Ernest said, it's just like what the Holy Spirit does. You know, you, the Holy Spirit is like a wind. You can't tell where the Spirit goes or where it leads. And I think that really speaks to our lives as Christians. It's never static. It's ever moving, ever changing, we're ever growing. So I believe that the Lord is inviting us to grow a new imagination. It's what Pastor Mike says all the time, to reimagine life in the spirit, what would it look like to leave all the norms that we've grown up with and that have been put on us and imagine a world where people are really made in the image of God and God is really pouring out his spirit on all flesh. What would it look like for you to be a part of that? My friends, in my opinion, this is what revival looks like. A changing of hearts, a changing of mind, a changing of perspective, and turning away from all the things that have uh, shaped us in toxic ways. So in order for this revival to spread, just like this virus, it takes it to start in each one of us. So can you just take a moment and just sit and pray? God, we thank you for this wonderful word. Thank you for opening our minds and shifting our imaginations. Lord, we say we are here with our hearts open, our hands open, our minds open. God, will you come in and do whatever you want to do? God, reshape, refashion our imagination. Let us be ever growing, ever loving, ever open to new ways that you are moving. Lord, release us from every toxic space and Every oppressive way that we have learned, God, decolonize our hearts, decolonize our souls so that we can bring heaven on earth. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, use us to bring heaven on earth. What is in heaven? Heaven, there's healing, there's wholeness. We are all in the image of God. We are created in his light. Heaven is full of joy and peace and us seeing each other correctly. God, will you use us to bring heaven on earth? We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for 
joining us today. Today has been an adventure, and I'm, I'm always down for a good adventure. So uh, we just thank you for being a family. Thank you for uh, being patient with us, and um, we're going to ride this thing out, and we're just going to continue to love on each other. We have so much happening. We're entering into July. Can you believe that? And July is very special at the way because it's our anniversary. It's our anniversary month. We are celebrating 15 years 15 years of ministry, 15 years of Pastor Mike leading us and leading the charge. So we want, we have so many great speakers, so many things in store. Please stay posted, stay tuned. We also are going to continue our noonday devotions. So join us every day at 12 o'clock, 12 noon, where we're just going to pour out and just recap and just share whatever God puts on a heart for a rhema word on that day. All right. We're so glad that you came to join us. Thank you for everyone who um, was a part of this worship service. Go in peace. Go and imagine. Go start thinking. Go journal. Go take a walk. Go let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit needs to do in your life. We love you so much. Have a blessed week. Be blessed. We love you. Bye. <laughs>